All right, you can go to Judges chapter 3. I know the slides are there. There we go. That's the title, Ehud. I'm going to read from uh, Judges 3 verse 12, and I'm going to go up to verse 30. Then I'm going to just move one verse. I'm going to leave one verse out, and then I'm going to read the beginning of chapter 4. Let's do that now. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord, he gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites, and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of the palms, a city of palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence, and all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to, came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat, and he had reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and dung came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came and when they saw that the door of the roof chambers the roof chamber were locked they thought surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber and they waited till they were embarrassed but when he still did not open the door of the roof chamber they took the key and opened them and threw and and there lay their their lord dead on the floor he had escaped while they delayed and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sarah. When he, when he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said, Follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of Jordan against the Moabites, and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest 80 years. To chapter 4, verse 1. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, after Ehud died. Let's pray. And then we'll look at this very colorful passage. Lord, we, we just want to thank you for your word. In all of its uh, realness, um, this is a, a graphic passage. Often people come to your word and um, they expect it to be like these pretty little Bible, Bible stories that we, we hear and we have in children's books. But the reality is the Bible deals with real life. The Bible deals with life in, in all of its ugliness. And we see that here in this passage. And Lord, we pray that we may not shy away from these difficult things. Um, Lord, we pray for much grace. We pray for myself that as we, we deal with a passage like this, Lord, that uh, I would do it in a sensitive manner, yet I would not shy away from from proclaiming your word boldly, saying what is clearly there in the passage. Lord, please grant much grace. Please also grant us ears to hear as this passage is preached. May you be glorified in the preaching of your word. Amen. 
as, as I was reading that, I'm sure you would agree with me, it blows my mind how Hollywood always tells the same Bible story. Noah and Moses. Because if they actually read the Bible, these, these people that want to make money, they want to make graphic movies a lot of the time, that, that they love to make so much, we'd probably have an Ehud movie by now. And man, it would have been filled with many things. It would have been filled with humor, you'll see in a moment, action, espionage, and some interesting politics. And it's my privilege to share this narrative with you today. Two comments before we, we jump into our first point for today. The first is beware, be aware that we are going to spend most of our time in the fourth point today. Um, seeing as that's where most of the narrative is, 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 that is contained. So um, just keep that in mind as we, we start. And secondly, remember the cycle of destruction Israel found themselves in. It's the cyclical crime, the cyclical response, the cyclical penalty, the cyclical solution, and the cyclical limitations to the solution. Remember the illustration I used was a circular stairway. Every time the cir circle goes, you find yourself in a lower position. You go another circle, you're in a lower position. This is what we're going to see in the book. Now we've clarified that. Let's move straight on into our first point for today. Benjamin and Ephraim's crime. Judges 3 verse 12a. Let's begin by reading the first part of verse 12. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. This is the same crime that Judah was accused of under Othniel, who was the previous judge. But the, but the text adds a word here that should pique our interest. What is that word? Again. Israel never learned from their past sins and made the same mistake repeatedly, as I've already mentioned. Don't want to say much more than that. Let's quickly apply this to our own lives. Instead of us reading this and shaking our heads at the folly of Israel, perhaps we should rather ask, which sin do I keep committing, despite God delivering me from the consequences of it each time? This could describe the person who ignores God's counsel in finding a spouse. And after leaving their abusive spouse, God granting them deliverance from this runs straight into the arms of another abusive person. You often see that cycle. This could also describe the person with the drive to be the best at their career, which is unbiblical. Now, take note that I said they desire to be the best. This is the competitive person. This is the person that when you beat them, they get angry, and they want to outdo you. And this person is willing to do whatever it takes to be the best, whatever the cost. But one day when they get warned after their first heart attack that if they carry on like this, they may leave their children as orphans, knowing that luck had nothing to do with their deliverance, but God has delivered them. But instead of listening to their doctor and changing their mindset to a more biblical one, like being a good steward in every area of their life, even if that means they won't be the top dog in their company, they go straight back to going all out in pursuit of, of their career aspirations, straight for the top. Insert your own sin and be aware that judges eventually ends in disaster. With which tribe? We're dealing with the tribe of Benjamin today. With the tribe of Benjamin almost destroyed because of a horrific rape. God's patience does 
eventually run out with you. So search your heart and mortify that sin. Bring that sin to an end before it's too late. Let's move on to our second point. Benjamin and Ephraim's punishment. Judges 3 verse 12b to 13. How did the Lord respond? He strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab. How did he strengthen this king? Eglon organized a coalition with the Ammonites and the Amalekites and defeated Israel, most likely securing portions of Benjamin and Ephraim, which were on the Jordan River there. Remember that Israel didn't have a, a, a king or a, a, a single king or a leader at that point, uh, not like Joshua or Moses ruling over the whole nation. The, the way the nation functioned at this point was far more fragmented. It was far more tribal. Each tribe was ruled by somebody else. Now, what happened is Eglon got involved with this coalition, and what did they do? They acquired the city of Palms, and this is of particular importance. What was the city of Palms? Well, it wasn't a city. It was the area where Jericho, and most likely Gilgal as well, used to be. You can see that in Deuteronomy 34, verse 3. And why was this a significant place to take control of? Well, not because, a lot of commentators think it's because Eglon rebuilt Jericho and there was a curse over anyone who rebuilt Jericho. There's nothing about that in the text of him rebuilding Jericho. Because he didn't. That would only happen again during the reign of King Ahab. Hundreds of years later, according to 1 Kings 16, verse 34. This is significant because it was an especially useful piece of land to be in control of. Because Moab was just on the other side of the Jordan River. So let me just give you a quick geography lesson. Israel were coming into the promised land just before the book of Joshua in... Um, in the book of Deuteronomy, um, Numbers. They're coming around. They come to the Jordan River on the eastern side of the promised land. What happens at this point is they travel through Moab. As far as I remember, they get in a, a battle with Og and defeat him. And I think Dan is given the territory on that side. Then on that eastern side of the Jordan River, before they cross the Jordan River into the Promised Land to the western side of the Jordan River, what happened is, they, yes, they crossed the Jordan River and then they came to Gilgal. Now, Moab was just on the other side of the Jordan River and Israel, the Promised Land, was just on this side of the Jordan River. So they could see each other across the river. So that's why it was such an important place to be in control of. And this meant, the, the reason it was so important was because it made getting into Israel a lot easier for Moab. They didn't have to fight their way into Israel each time because they controlled both, both the eastern and the western bank of the Jordan. So if they wanted to bring military over, they wanted to bring encampments over, they didn't have to, you know, not that they could shoot in those days, but, you know, shoot their way across the river. They could just travel across nicely. You know, both sides were controlled by this enemy. So as we're thinking with a uh, military battle mind, this was a key place to be in control of because if you control this area, you could bring troops over very, very easily. Let's move on to our next point. Benjamin and Ephraim's response. Judges 3 verse 14 and 15a. So Benjamin and Ephraim served Eglon for 18 
years. Ten years longer than Judah. It took them ten years longer to cry out to, for the Lord, to the Lord for deliverance. Now, this is the first observation we have of the hardening of heart that we're going to see as we progress through the book. Now, after 18 years of oppression, which was brought on by their own disobedience to God, they finally cried out to the Lord. That's grace there. Just a reminder of what I said in relation to this two weeks back. I'm not going to say too much about it. But God sometimes afflicts us to restore us to himself. We see that in Hebrews 12, verse 5 to 11. He disciplines those he loves. Beware how long you resist his discipline, though, because the longer you, want to re you take to respond, the more it may cost you. Remember, I'm speaking to Christians here. God will not tolerate your sin so long as you want to just carry on. He will discipline you, and you'll do it for your own good. Let's move on to the next point. Benjamin and Ephraim's Savior. Judges 3, verse 15b to 30. Now, this is the fourth point. This is where we're going to spend most of our time. Everything up to this point, if we were making this into a movie. We, we all watch movies. If we were making this into a movie, would have been the prologue, where the narrator gives you the context of the story. From now up till verse 30, we will be watching basically a spy thriller with a bit of comedic flavoring. Now, in preparation for this, let's hear what Dale Ralph Davis has to say about the comedic aspect of this text. And um, Del Ralph Davis is no lightweight. This is probably the leading scholar on the book of Judges. This is what he said. Try to hear this story as an Israelite would have heard it or told it. An Israelite, remember, who for 18 years, in verse 14, had been oppressed and taxed to the bone under blubbery King Eglon. An Israelite, therefore, living in persistent poverty, eking out some sort of borderline existence in the hill country of Ephraim. Then you won't be sur surprised, but rather will understand the pure enjoyment, the devastating humor, the biting satire, the sheer hilarity of this narrative. Let's be entertained and learn from one of the most colorful narratives in all of Scripture. We begin by learning that the Lord raised up a deliverer for Israel, none other than Ehud, the Benjamite, who just so happened to be a lefty. With his left-handedness being what makes him such an unorthodox judge. Remember, the next three judges are highly unorthodox. Now, you may ask, why would being a lefty have made him unorthodox? Well, there are two options. Number one, being left-handed throughout history has been viewed as a handicap or a deficiency. My wife just so happens to be a left-hander, and she's much smarter than me, so I know it's no handicap. But um, it has in history. Just listen to a short piece from Bloomfield, there was another passage as I was doing my research that I found from CNN, which actually spoke up to 50 years ago it was viewed as a handicap. But listen to Bloomfield instead. The writer had good reason to inform us that Ehud was left-handed. This is not problematic in our culture, but in those days it was considered to be a handicap. This is reflected in the Hebrew text, where the word for left-handed means literally Hindered in the right hand. You can't use your right hand. To be left-handed was seen as defective, being weaker and less able than right-handed people. Never thought I'd be happy to be a righty, but uh, it doesn't really matter today. The second reason his left-handedness could have been significant is Ehud may have had an actual disability in his right arm. 
Another commentator, Robert Robinson, adopts this position. He was Ehud, who is described as a left-handed man. Literally, he was hindered in his right hand, which implies that he suffered from a deformed hand. Regardless of which commentator you agree with, it's clear that Ehud was in no way a threatening man, which you'll see the importance of in just a moment. Now, he was the, he was the man that took the tributes or the taxes to the king from Israel. This means that he must have been viewed as a reliable person in general and in the eyes of Israel. Because if those taxes never got to the king, he was going to be in trouble. And the whole nation was going to be in trouble. Those kings were not nice people. And he was also obviously not a threatening person. Which we have already established with his left-handedness. Because if there was some legendary Israeli soldier that was delivering the tributes, I don't think the king would want him anywhere near him. You know, if he knew the guy could hit the, hit the bullseye from 50 meters away, you don't want that guy anywhere near you. Now in verse 16, we see that he made a double-edged dagger. It basically, what's described there in, in verse 16 is a dagger. And he hid it on his right thigh under his clothes. Now, why did he hide it on the right thigh under his clothes? He probably, well, let's start with the dagger. Why did he make a dagger? He first, he had to make the dagger because he had to make it because there were probably no left-handed tools back in those days. Have you ever tried to find left-handed tools for today? Sometimes that's not an easy thing. Back in those days, he would have had to make a dagger for himself. So keep that in mind. And he strapped it on his right thigh because no one would suspect a blade on his right thigh because they'd expect it on his left, where a right-handed person would put it. And the reason it was a dagger, a dagger was easier to hide. Some commentators believe that it was a specific kind of hilt that was actually would go against the skin a lot more easily. It wasn't, it wasn't a bulky dagger. So Ehud, regardless of how well he hid this dagger, was taking a major risk to deliver this tribute to the king with this dagger on his thigh. If he was searched thoroughly, which they most likely were, him and those who were with him would have been killed on the spot. We also see that Eglon was a very obese man, giving the idea that he got fat through the oppression of the Israelites. While the Israelites were busy starving, eking out an existence, Eglon was eating too much. That's the idea the text wants you to get. When I think of Eglon, the picture that comes to my mind is Jabba the Hutt from Star Wars. The real Star Wars, not the new ones. Now, Ehud and the men that accompanied him presented the tribute. And they probably made a big show about it, probably telling him that he was worthy of all that they had brought him. They, these, these guys, they wanted you to, to praise them. And you come and you deliver a tribute, but you deliver that tribute and you don't deliver it with enough pizzazz, oh, I'm sorry, my friends, you're going down. After this, Ehud and his men left Eglon, and they made their way to Gilgal, probably the most important site in all of Israel at that point. Remember, that's where they crossed the Jordan River coming in. For the very first time they came, they touched the promised land. It was in Gilgal. What a precious place. And there Ehud separated from the group. Why? Why at Gilgal? What's interesting here is that they describe the location where he separated in verse 19. They describe it in the following way. 
he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal. Take note of that, at the idols near Gilgal. There may be great significance to this, according to Benson. Listen to what he had to say. Some suppose that these images had been placed there by the Moabites in contempt of the God of Israel, who had so long honored Gilgal with his presence, and that they might ascribe the subjection of the land to their idols as the Israelites gave the glory of their conquest to the true God. And they, and they further suppose that when Ehud beheld these idolatrous images, he was inflamed with zeal and indignation. He returned to Eglon at this point with a secret message for the king. After what was most likely a really humiliating tribute presentation to this, this king, Eglon, and the fact that Ehud was such an unthreatening man, this left-handed person, Eglon thought it was safe to be alone with this pathetic little man. So he sent all his attendants out of his chamber. Get out. What can this pathetic little man do to me? He had made his way to the king to deliver this message from God. With Ehud using the general name of God, Elohim, knowing that Eglon would not find that threatening, in the same way that when we speak of God generically, people don't seem to be offended. But the moment you speak of Jesus, that changes very quickly. In verse 21 to 22, we have a graphic description of Eglon's execution at the left hand of Ehud. It describes how he grabbed the blade from his thigh and thrust it into the belly of the king. Let me read verse 22 to you. Bearing in mind that the graphic nature of this account was specifically chosen by God. This is Holy Spirit inspired. Remember that this book wants you to feel uncomfortable, even if there's a humor to this as well. And the hilt also went in after the blade. And the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly. And the dung came out. God humiliated his enemy. He didn't grant this wicked king a noble death. He would escaped, but not before locking the chambers behind him. The embarrassing nature of this account continues, with his attendants wondering why he was taking so long to usher them back in. They assumed that he was on the toilet, probably due to the smell emanating from the room. Their fear of him also just so happens to show that he probably wasn't a gracious man. Because they waited till they were embarrassed before checking up on him. They got the keys, opened up the room, only to find their precious king dead. In that time, Ehud escaped to Sarah. And he blew a trumpet to signal the death of Eglon and their impending victory. A united Israel, which is important because that's not always going to be the case. A united Israel. People from different tribes of Israel working together for liberation. Under Ehud's leadership came from the hill country and took control of the city of Palms. In the valley, in the area along the Jordan River referred to as the Fords of the Jordan. They took control of the west coast of the Jordan River, the place that Moab was getting into so easily. While Moab was shell-shocked by the death of their king, Israel struck. Israel made sure that there would be no place where 
the Moabites would be able to cross the Jordan River into the promised land safely. Again, remember, Moab was on the east side of the Jordan and Israel on the west. But who granted Israel this victory despite some top-class espionage? God. Just listen to Ehud's words to the soldiers before taking control of the fords of the Jordan. This is what he said. Follow after me for the Lord. Now, why is this significant? For the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant name of God, not Elohim, has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. Israel killed 10,000 Moabites in that time. And that's not a small feat. This is a nation that subdued them for 18 years. They went into battle after battle after battle and lost every time. It was like South Africa going to Australia for cricket. You didn't believe it was possible to beat them until we did. And successfully prevented their enemies from coming back into their land. What a glorious victory. Israel would have peace for 80 years. Now, before we observe the limitations of Ehud as a savior, let's pull out one practical lesson from this account. One thing we notice in this account is that what's viewed as a handicap in the world can be a source of strength in God's hands. As I mentioned two weeks back, God's glory in using limited resources God glories in using limited resources to do his perfect work. Why? Because it shames the world. You see it throughout Scripture, whether it's using barren women who were viewed as less than other women in those days to be the mother of some of the greatest heroes of the faith. Whether it was choosing the youngest and least impressive of Jesse's sons to be the next king of Israel and deliver them from a seemingly unbeatable giant of a man, an unbeatable foe, or whether it was Jesus calling a tax collector the scourge of Judean society to be one of his disciples. Often when one gets saved and they desire to be like Christ, we pursue that goal by following the example of other more mature Christians than ourselves. And you know what? That's a good thing. According to 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Follow my example as I follow Christ's example. The mistake we make at this point, though, is that we think uniformity and unity are the same thing, and they're not. We are guilty of uniformity when we want to be like Spurgeon, Whitfield, Edwards, and Calvin. So we get saved, and then we, we read their biographies and hear of how Spurgeon read six books a week, becoming discouraged in the process. You know what? Because we can't do that. Yet we ignore that Spurgeon had a photographic memory and was an avid reader before he was even saved. We think that for the church to be healthy, we need every member to be exactly like Charles Spurgeon. Just a church full of Spurgeons, or a church full of Calvins, or a church full of Whitfields. So instead of seeing where our strengths lie, and seeking to utilize them in the local church, we instead beat ourselves up and we give up. Sometimes blaming the church, and we say, that church has unreal expectations of us. When in reality, we are the ones that have the unreal expectations. We put the unreal expectations on ourselves. The church never did it. The church just wants you to help with tea. Instead of using our strengths in areas of the church that are lacking, 
We seek to do more in the areas where there's an abundance of people already serving. The places that get the most praise. 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, it speaks of the church as being made up of many parts. Functioning in unity. Different parts, different things working in unity with one another. Yet sometimes we fall into the trap of believing that every member should be an I, including ourselves. When God actually, you know what, He might be calling you to be a foot. Doesn't sound romantic, being a foot, but have you ever not had a foot? It's not pleasant. I am, well, I have I've injured my foot, and it's not pleasant. God, God, uh, he might actually be calling you, he might have given you everything that you need to be the most amazing foot ever, the most amazing foot possible. But you want to be an eye. Stop trying to be an eye and be that foot instead of wishing you were an eye. Use your left handedness to serve the Lord in a way that nobody else in the church can because they need you to serve in that area. Let's move on to our final point, and we'll conclude with this. Benjamin and Ephraim's Savior's Limitations, and that's Judges 4, verse 1. This is a recurring theme. This is the ultimate point of the book. Once again, we're reminded of the sad reality of this book. In Judges 4, verse 1, it says... And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. While discussing slavery to sin and the inadequacies of Ehud, considering his inability to stop Israel from their habit of forsaking the Lord, Dale Ralph Davis wrote the following. And I use this quote because the theme is constant and we can hear it in a different way from a different person. Now some church members may say, yes, yes. But remember, we are not a bunch of primitive Israelite idol worshippers. We are the people of God. And so was Israel. All of them circumcised, card-carrying Israelites and in utter bondage to sin. He's saying they weren't saved. And one may be baptized, catechized, Organ, uh, might be a baptized, catechized, organized Presbyterian. He's a Presbyterian, by the way. Yet a slave of sin. The same goes for Baptists, Methodists, whomever. That's why it's such, a go- it's such good news to hear of him who loves us and has set us free from our sins at the cost of his blood. For our real bondage does not consist of Moabites or fat kings or physical and economic oppression. No left-handed savior can break us free from our tyrant. But there is one with nail-scarred hands who can and does. The only tragedy in our story will be if having this savior we do not cry out to him for help. For Yahweh has raised up for us a savior. Jesus, who shall save his people from their sins. Let me end with this. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are powerless to overcome sin in your life on your own, in your own strength. So stop fighting the battle on your own. Stop it. Whether it's through prayerlessness or isolation from the local church, stop isolating yourself from the means of grace. And for those who don't know Christ, how much longer are you gonna are you gonna suffer under the oppressive slavery to sin? That destructive cycle that you find yourself on, where you do the same thing over and over and over again, descending into further disaster. How much longer are you gonna be on that road? Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this account of Ehud. We thank you that, Lord, you use the things that the world deems as weak, pathetic, and you, you take them and you use them for your glory and the good of your people, the deliverance of your people. We thank you, Lord, that even though um, a human being cannot save us from our slavery to sin, Thank you that you sent your son, the God-man, 100% God, 100% man, to save us from what no normal human being could save us from. Lord, we pray that for many who are sitting here that have felt um, that they are losing this battle against sin, that they would cease from relying on their own faculties to fight it and rely on you more and they'd pray more that they would rely more on the local church and their brothers and sisters in Christ confessing their sin to one another there's many ways Lord and Lord um, we also pray for the lost we pray that you may save them we pray that um, if necessary Lord you may continue to to crush them if necessary so that they may come to a point eventually where they do repent. Please, Lord, be gracious. Change their hearts and point them to yourself. 